All right, so we're going to start the session on joining art, science, and humanities through togetherness. Sorry to interrupt the, the poster presentations, but thank you guys for coming back. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed a very energizing poster session and had a good lunch and maybe got some coffee to sustain you through all these afternoon presentations. And that at this point, you're maybe even starting to think about what happens after the waste conference is over. I have some ideas for this. Um, my name is Britt Myers, and I work for the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. And in this presentation, I'm um, really just providing a little bit of an introduction to our community, uh, talking to you about a few tools and programs that we have available to all of you um, uh, as you do work in Western Alaska and are trying to connect with interdisciplinary collaborators moving forward. And then um, I have a, a special invitation to extend to all of you for a, a few events that are happening this week. But before I do any of that, I don't want to forget to acknowledge um, my co-authors for this presentation, Lisa Sheffield Guy and Helen Wiggins, and to thank the National Science Foundation for their support of our work. Okay, next slide. So ARCID, we are a not-for-profit um, based in Fairbanks, Alaska. We have a small staff of about nine full-time employees, four part-time employees, not very big um, in terms of localized staff, but we have this huge community of individual institutional members. And we've been around since 1988. Um, we're supported in the work that we do by the National Science Foundation through a cooperative agreement. And they fund us in this way because the work we do is very much in service to the same community that they support through their grant making and beyond. So um, we're, our focus is on um, researchers who work in the Arctic, um, both from the US and um, international collaborators who um, want to make sure that they're uh, engaged with their colleagues um, here in the U.S. Um, next slide. Uh, and as you can see uh, from all of these logos, um, the community is very diverse. Lots of different kinds of organizations, everything from University of Alaska Fairbanks to University of Washington to indigenous organizations like Quaric to nonprofits like the Alaska Ocean Observing System, Sitka Sound Science Center, uh, to businesses like ABR or agencies and labs like the National Renewable Energy Lab. And what all of these uh, organizations have in common and the reason that they're involved is that they recognize that Arctic research is a collaborative sport. None of this happens in isolation. It happens across disciplines. It happens across institutions. It happens across knowledge systems. And um, you have to kind of maintain those connections. You have to work at that. You have to um, invest in that. And that's what they are doing. Um, that's what our Arkansas programs are designed to help with. Um, and next slide. Uh, our institutional members um, each have a representative. Um, and we have them listed on our website. So if you're ever trying to engage with those folks, you can go to our website and find a really wonderful contact there um, to talk to about the work that's going on in the Arctic in their, their organization. Um, and our institutional members elect the ARCIS board of directors. So the, these smiling folks are another um, resource to all of you. Um, if you um, want, are wanting to look, uh, expand your community connections, um, you're looking for partners in your work, uh, I really uh, invite you to take a look at the faces names on this slide. And if you see somebody that you know, or you don't know them, use that as an excuse to reach out and get in touch with these guys, with, the, with this group. Okay, next slide. Uh, and so that's a little bit about who we are. Um, some of the things that are open to all of you to access, because all, all of our um, work is very uh, open, it's not exclusive to the, the network um, that exists. Um, it's open to all individuals, anybody can be part of it or, or take advantage of these resources. Um, I've got a lot of stuff here to run through, but uh, things like a, a listserv, where if you have job openings, or if you're looking for a job, or funding opportunities, or you're looking for funding, or events coming up, um, or uh, calls for abstracts for um, conference sessions um, for future waste conferences. Um, the, uh, our listservs are a great place to post that kind of information. We have a calendar that has events um, up for activities that have, uh, relevant to Arctic research that are happening all over the place. Uh, so if you're looking for future conferences to present at, um, be sure to check that kind of uh, information out. Um, we have directories. So um, 
NSF asked us to put together a little project directory for navigating the new Arctic project for those of you who are involved in navigating the new Arctic. So if you're um, interested in finding out more about who's involved in, in that work, you can go to the directory that we have online. Um, we also have just a, a broad general directory of Arctic researchers. So if you're involved in Arctic research in any way, put yourself in the directory because people are um, accessing it to try, to try and find additional collaborators. Uh, we also have um, compiled different kinds of material on uh, really relevant uh, topics um, to, that we're discussing here um, at this conference. So how do you work um, in an interdisciplinary way? We've got a, we had a committee that got together and had some recommendations, put out a report on that. Um, we've compiled researcher, uh, um, uh, a bunch of information from different communities on con conducting um, research in northern communities, working with rural um, in Alaska uh, around uh, Arctic SIM. And um, in addition to that, we're doing all of these uh, networking active events um, and, and programs that bring people together. So one of these um, kinds of things is a, a funders meet and greet where we um, bring researchers and other community members together with uh, funders who are, are uh, supporting uh, the work that goes on in the Arctic. Um, we have an indigenous scholars program um, Tonya Osborne, who is here with me at the conference, um, was one of our former Indigenous scholars. Um, and those scholars uh, visit uh, Washington, D.C. to talk to agency officials, um, policymakers, about um, issues that are really important to them and their communities. Uh, we have a community and citizen science uh, in the Far North Conference that we uh, started in 2020 and will be repeating again in the um, coming year. Uh, yeah, so I'm building that community of practice. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention is our CIs for Walrus Outlook program. Next slide. So if you were at the WAVE conference last year, you may have heard a presentation from Amy Hendricks uh, from UAF. Uh, she had just uh, done an evaluation of the CIs for Walrus Outlook um, with support from the Alaska Sea Grant. Um, and so you could probably go back and check out her presentation for a little bit more in-depth um, overview of CIRU and, and all of that good work. But the CIS for Wallace Outlook um, brings together Western scientists and forecasts from the National Weather Service um, and on-the-ground observations from a number of community observers in Bering Strait region to um, put out uh, seasonal reports um, around early spring breakup that are really useful. Um, for uh, subsistence hunters, for uh, people uh, um, just wanting to understand what the travel conditions are. Uh, and it's used, there's a really good, uh, I shouldn't say that, I should say uh, a well established uh, community of users and a big Facebook group that has um, grown up around that. Uh, and um, with the evaluation, I think we were hearing a lot of, um, you need more CWU, you need more CWU in other communities. We need to include other kinds of information beyond just the sea ice conditions and um, weather info. So things like that are relevant to the subsistence users, policy uh, stuff, emergency preparedness, so other kinds of content for those reports. Uh, uh, they also want us to increase the opportunities for the um, local observers, so partnering with other networks to expand those kinds of opportunities and finding um, uh, other ways that we can bring the information uh, that doesn't require you to be online. <laughs> so um, lots of really good ideas that we're working on to address. And um, any of that sound familiar to the work that you guys are doing, we're, um, we'd love to uh, put you in touch with Lisa Sheffield Guy, who manages this program, um, because we'd love to partner. Okay, so that's a little bit about the stuff that we do. Um, for the, the, my remaining time, just want to talk a, a little bit about some of the things that we're thinking about doing in the future. Um, and in uh, August of 2020, the National Science Foundation put out a Dear Colleague letter inviting uh, proposals for uh, collaboration hubs, hubs that, of uh, projects that are bringing together um, communities and Western researchers in innovative ways. And with um, the CIS for Walrus Outlook program, um, key partners like Kuwerik and ICC Alaska that we uh, work with on the Indigenous Scholars Program, we have um, what we feel is a really strong kernel of a, a hub already kind of in place. 
that we're looking to expand, and we're thinking about how to do that and who to engage in that work. Um, so one of the ways that we could approach that is like going through, you know, the R map to find, you know, all the NNA or NSF um, researchers that are operating in these locations. Um, you know, searching through all of these uh, different databases that are out there. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for everybody to find out all this kind of information. So we're wanting to um, do what we can to help synthesize some of that, um, make it easier for our community to understand who the actors are out there, who, who, who is working in different communities. And one way we're going to do that is by hosting a workshop this fall. So uh, next slide. Um, and before we got to the workshop, um, you know, I had to come here first um, because this, this, this has been going on for quite a while. You guys are already an established community, so I needed to know more about who was here. Um, it was fun to, I did just a little network analysis of like which organizations were involved um, for the past couple of years as presenters. So there's definitely some ARCUS members and you, you guys are a big contingent, obviously you host the conference. Um, but it was really fun to see all these other blue dots, which indicate other organizations that we're not as familiar with. Um, so I'm excited to be here to get to know some of you. Um, and next slide. And um, to hear, to invite you all to, to join us in this workshop that we're, we're planning for this fall. Um, long before the um, Dear Colleague letter came out, Arcus was already asking our community about what kind of collaborations they wanted to see happen. And these um, collaborations that are about um, standing interdisciplinary boundaries, uh, you know, bringing social scientists together with natural physical scientists, um, connecting with communities is the top of the list in terms of who people want to speak with. They don't, they, they do care about, um, you know, funders and they do care about uh, decision makers, but these are the priorities. Um, and similarly, uh, the, uh, I think there have been a lot of efforts in the past to create online um, spaces for people to connect and engage with one another. Um, we do speed networking events, but that's not what people are asking for. They're asking for um, very focused workshops around um, themes or topics. And so that's what we're doing. We're going to do a workshop around Western Alaska. Next slide. Um, and uh, this event uh, is being planned as a hybrid activity with a few uh, online meetings in October, but the National Park Circuit will be holding a, uh, a, a um, celebration around their shared Beringian heritage program in early November. And so we're going to have a culminating activity around in person in Anchorage around that event. And so I'm just going to end with this with this invitation to please consider um, taking part in this workshop. Um, Tonya, um, who is here at the conference with me, is also hoping to think about how um, uh, all of your organizations are working with communities. So um, please consider talking to her if you haven't already about your work. Um, and then uh, please help us share this information. Um, once we have more details, we'll be uh, putting it out on our kids' listservs and, and our newsletters. So join, um, sign up for that if you aren't already, so that you'll hear more about this workshop. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening with NNA? <laughs> this is it, right? This is the last. Well, I've had conversations with our program officers that haven't conclusively said that it's the end. So I, I'm not sure that they know yet. So. Hello. Courtney will be here in a minute. Here, okay. here. Okay. We're doing one of the <laughs> demonstrations for the VR. Oh, are you guys going to bring one for this? Um, no, we weren't. Oh, anyway. <laughs> it's such a Next setup, time. but please, like, we have a table over in the other room. So if anybody wants to come and try out the VR, please do. Um, it's, it's fun, especially if you're not prone to, like, <laughs> More enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna have that that kind of hangover feeling, which is no fun for anybody. And yeah, I'm very proud of it.
so I know it well. Um, so uh, thanks everybody. We're, we're really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Tara Borland, this is Courtney Grace, and we're both with Alaska F-Score. Um, we have so many things going on with FSCOR that we're going to like really kind of talk about things at a high level, but I just kind of want to preface this that, like I said, we do have a table over here, and so if you hear of anything that you're like, I want to know more about it, come talk to us. Um, so next slide. Um, this right here real quick is just the current leads of the project. So as you can see, it's a statewide program across all the MIU, MAUs. Um, and at the end, I'll have another slide with my contact and Courtney's contact so you guys can take that down if you want to contact us for any other information. So we'll start off with what is F-score. Um, I naively always think everybody knows what F-score is because that's all I hear about every day. Um, but a lot of times, absolutely no one's really heard of it. So F-score is a National Science Foundation program. It's a five-year, $20 million grant. Um, to be competitive for an F-score grant, a uh, state has to receive below a certain threshold of NSF funding over a five-year period. So the map up there, you can see all of the different states um, and jurisdictions that qualify. There's currently 28 F-score um, jurisdictions. Um, so F-score, the established program to stimulate competitive research, is really just that. It's about building research infrastructure in these states that currently aren't receiving a lot of science um, foundation funding. So they call them their RII grants, which is Research Infrastructure Improvement Grants. Um, we are in the fifth year of our current NSF score project. It's called Fire and Ice. Um, go to the next slide. So this is the mission of our project right now. Um, I'll go into the research themes on the next slide, but you just wait here for a minute. So with that $20 million, what are the types of things that we're spending money on in addition to research? Because there's just so much more than research that um, we do. Part of that research infrastructure improvement is bringing in new faculty hires. So when the proposals are written, they're looking at what kind of science we wanna do um, and where we need to kind of improve the expertise, what fields we don't really have in Alaska where researchers are, are experts in that. And we do up to five new faculty hires over the course of the, the five-year grant. Um, next slide. So the two themes of Fire and Ice are coastal margins and boreal fires. Um, they're both looking at climate-driven changes um, in the ecosystems. And like I said, we're at the end of that one. So in October, that, this one will be wrapping up. But we do have a new proposal in. Um, so next slide. So the next project is called Glaciers to Gulf, and it's kind of really taking that coastal margins piece and expanding on it. Um, so it's looking at climate change induced glacial runoff and how that affects marine resources in the Gulf of Alaska region. Next slide. So what I think is really cool about the way the researchers wrote the Glaciers to Gulf proposal was that before they wrote it, they started having meetings with stakeholders in the communities where they want to do the research. So they had um, webinars, they actually went out and visited and, and spoke with community members, um, in, um, also including farmers and agencies, to find out like, hey, we're going to be here doing this kind of research, what species are, interest, are of interest to you? Like why, what would you like us to see dig in further to? Um, next slide. And so from those meetings, they came up with this current uh, species of interest list. So right now, as it stands, between what the researchers were interested in and what the communities are interested in. These are um, some of the species that will be part of the Glacier Skull Project. Next slide. So why we're really here today though, besides introducing you to EBSCOR, is to talk about all the other stuff that we do with Alaska, Alaska EBSCOR because there are a lot of opportunities um, that we want folks to know about, um, including things with economic and workforce development, education, and community outreach. Next slide. So we'll start with um, economic development. So, oh, I think we missed one. It's okay. If we, if we can't get it back, it won't be the end of it. Yeah, this guy right here. Or actually, you missed two, I guess. Okay, well, you can see here in the smaller slide, it's just kind of an, it just wanted to highlight um, some of our current collaborators. 
Um, one of the important things that we do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So many logos. Picture really <laughs> awesome logos. Way more than those two. <laughs> um, to be able to do all the different programs that we do, we really rely heavily on partnerships and collaborations. Um, so we we work with a bunch of different groups within and outside of the university. Um, can try that one. So all of our economic development activities, we look at STEM-based economic development activities. The groups that we've been um, partnering with on those types of activities have been um, the Center for Innovation, Commercialization, and Entrepreneurship, Alaska Trend, which is the Technology Research and Development Center of Alaska that's based at UAA, and the Arctic Innovation Competition. So the next slide. So <laughs> some, of the, some of the programs that we work with are, or that we do with economic development um, with Center Ice, one of them is Students to Startups. So Students to Startups is a super cool program that's matching UA students with local Alaska startups. Um, it's a mutually beneficial program because the students are learning about what it takes you know, to start up a company and startups have access to all of these resources at Alaska Center Ice to kind of learn what they can do um, uh, customer discovery, like all different things, and they have all these resources that they have full access to when they when they join the startup company, and they get an intern from UA to kind of help them with what they're doing at the time. Um, Center Ice and Trend both put on SBIR and SDTR workshops that we help support, and so those are small grants, the Small Business Innovation Research Grants and Small Business Technology Transfer um, Grants. So we put uh, Center Ice and Trend will put on workshops to help startups learn about those opportunities, um, what's available, and how they can get access to that. And one step further, Alaska Trend does Phase Zero awards, which we support. So the Phase Zero awards are kind of that step leading up to SBIR and STTR. So the the local Alaska startups that receive those awards receive help from pro professionals to learn how to write the proposals um, be, and be more competitive. And STTR grants. Um, we also support the Arctic Innovation Competition, which is an annual competition. Um, they have different divisions for kids and adults. And when Alaska EPSCOR started um, helping out with that, we started the Kicker Prize. So it's, it's a 2000 additional prize. And we do it for the best climate adaptation um, submission for the year. And I just wanted to highlight April 22nd. Um, coming up is when they're going to be announcing all of those winners. And it's really great. If you go onto their website, you can look and see what all the submissions are. And there is there is an award where, you know, people going in can vote and pick their favorites. So definitely check that out. Workforce development. We do a lot of workforce development um, for our uh, early career faculty, for all of our students. EPSCOR supports so many faculty and so many students, um, and we want to do what we can to also kind of increase their, their workforce development. One thing that we're really excited about that was started two years ago, I think, is our student ambassador series. So we decided that it shouldn't be us dictating what kind of workforce development we're offering to the students. We want to hear from the students. What do you need? Um, what would you like to have done? So each year, we um, elect a student ambassador from each of the coastal margins and the boreal fires components, and they help us determine what kind of um, professional development we'll put on. So we've done things like grant writing, applying for agency jobs. This one was really popular. We opened that up to students across all UA, and we had people from different agencies come in and tell their stories, like how did they get their foot in the door, um, you know, uh, how to write resumes, like what is your best kind of path forward if you want to if you want to work with agencies. Um, also, how to be a good reviewer was another one we put on. Another program that we we partner with and will continue to partner with with Glaciers to Gulf is the AMSEP, the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program. So we have offered internships to AMSEP students to work with our researchers in the summer, and we'll continue to do that with the Glaciers to Gulf, and we'll hopefully do at least three AMSEP students every year in that project. And we work with the Sitka Sound Science Center. So this is another exciting professional development opportunity that we offer for our researchers and our students. Two of their programs that we um, that we place students in and researchers in and we help um, support are the Scientists in Residency Fellowship. So this is a one month long sabbatical in Sitka where researchers get to work on their, um, their own work for a little bit, but also get great, a great amount of science communication training. 
and they also get kind of hands-on experience in all these different situations in Sitka. Um, one thing that I think is really cool that they do is they highly encourage research, researchers to come and incorporate their, not just their professional passions, but their personal passions into um, their communication with the public. One researcher in particular, um, she likes to knit. So she did uh, a series where she taught the community how to knit sea stars. And while they're knitting and learning, they're talking about her research. And I think it's just way more impactful. And it's been a really great program for our researchers to be a part of. And then the second program is the scientists in the schools. So this is kind of a mini or one. It's a one week um, trip in Sitka. And they work with their, their K-12 education specialists there. And they get paired with teachers in the community that are looking to do projects based on the type of research that that researcher is doing. And they, they learn how to interact with the students. They learn how to kind of model their, their discussions so that the students will have something to take away from it. So it's been really great. And we're definitely continuing to do that partnership with Glaciers to Gold as well. So, okay. <laughs> I saw multiple things. It's making sure. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so these are opportunities, travel awards, pro professional development awards, and seed awards. All three of these we currently do, and we will continue to do with the next F score. Many people who came here um, came on our travel awards. So we do waste travel awards every year. Um, some of them turned into professional development awards because of COVID. So we always kind of did a certain amount of travel awards every year. COVID hit, no one could travel. What do we do with this money? Um, and so we kind of transitioned to that to professional development type activities or workshops that were available online. And we were able to do a load of those because usually registration is a lot cheaper than, than flying. And it seemed like those were really popular. So we're gonna kind of keep with that where the travel awards can be going to conferences or it could be going to get training. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for those. If anybody is interested in um, finding out about those as they come, please let us know, we'll add you to our mailing list. One of the professional development awards that we created <laughs> this past year was the SCUBA Inclusion Award because our Coastal Margins Project relies so heavily on um, SCUBA as being part of the field work. We wanted to be able to kind of open up those opportunities to folks to be able to get their certification and participate in the field work. And then we also do seed awards. So seed awards are really important to F score projects. So it's essentially like we look for anyone who has kind of really new innovative thoughts on ways to expand the type of research that we're doing currently. Um, so we do those every year of the project for students and for researchers. And we also collaborate with Alaska Embry. So Embry is kind of the sister program of um, EPSCOR. It's an NIH kind of version of it. And both of us are based in UAF. And so we come together because we have similar chunks of money for things like professional development. And we decided to kind of capitalize on that, like, hey, let's come together. We need similar professional development. Let's do these larger workshops. So we're really excited to offer this Ignite workshop this year. It was the first time we did it. We had three tracks for staff, student, and faculty. Um, we did some in-house training, and then we also brought in some uh, folks from outside to give other additional training. You see on the right, that's Dr. Sharon Milgram from NIH, and she did several series on resiliency. She's wonderful. I highly recommend her. She's got a lot of stuff online and we hope we can bring her back again because she's fantastic. Um, in addition with Embry, we've also put on grant writing workshops. We've done implicit bias workshops. And with the Alan Alda science communication team, we've brought them up to do additional science communication workshops for all of our, our faculty and students. Um, next slide. All right, and now I'm gonna pass it to Courtney who's gonna talk more about education and community participation. Yeah. So um, in addition to the um, like the wildfire, the research arms of our EPSCOR grant, um, DO is a diverse, standing for diversity education workforce development is another arm um, as part of this grant. And that's where I'm housed under, um, which also is, um, you know, these are our three main goals as per the strategic plan, which I know everyone loves to read. But uh, basically also that sort of like 
capacity building effort um, with a big focus on K through 12 and STEM education. And that can be as a whole throughout the state, um, but we always try to link it up with what the communities we are conducting our research are in are interested in, what they need, and trying to deliver ongoing research. Next slide. So for example, we're fire nights. Wildfire um, in the boreal forest is a big research topic. And um, we had a postdoc, Megan McGinty, who developed a wildfire and change in Alaska curriculum. And it's very, um, it, it was designed for grades three through five, but we've done multiple teacher workshops with people from all K through 12 and even PE teachers. And you know, so after school programs. So this has been piloted and taken out into the field um, in a lot of different ways. And you can see with this little um, image here, it's all about kind of talking about how wildfire would spread, but it really kicks off with also um, wildfire as a cycle and the natural cycle of that. So this is available at our table um, in the other room. So I'd love to, and I have additional resources, additional games. They were designed specifically to be able to like travel really well across the state. Um, and I would be very interested in talking to anyone who might think they think they could work this into their, um, wherever they work, um, schools, or like I said, um, other sort of like community outreach opportunities. Next slide. Um, so on the other side, ICE, we work really closely with the Catchment Bay Natural, National Estuarine Research Reserve, and we're creating transferable education models, which is kind of like that curriculum, a hands-on educational tool that ties really closely in with the different research topics and methods and findings of our coastal emergence team. And we also do teacher workshops, stakeholder presentations, which can be like community brown bags. Um, and it's always tied to uh, our lo their local communities. We're working on taking these also on the road and like piloting them in different communities or just sharing them. We're purchasing and um, making kits of supplies for these activities. So again, if you're interested in something for classrooms, please follow reach out to me and I'd love to talk more. Up top is like a fun watershed activity. This is a groundwater model um, talking about how water is moving underneath the surface. And this is some of our teacher workshops. And on the right is a public um, outreach, uh, like a kind of a science night where we'd have different tables and anyone, um, kids and adults, and we'd be able to walk through and learn a little bit about a bunch of stuff at the same time. We will be having, um, KB Nara's partner in the Glaciers to Gulf as well, and they are going to be conducting some field classes for high school students. And a lot of these things can bring students from all over the state. So um, even though like this is based in Cashmere Bay, please don't think that wouldn't include your areas. Next slide. A really cool program. Um, this is under the Inspiring Girls Expedition program. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but they bring 16 and 17 year old girls out into the backcountry. Um, and doing field science. And again, this pulls, um, thanks for funding from Alaska EPSCOR and the, you know, the people who run these programs. Um, we have girls on water doing kayaking and girls in the forest pack rafting. This is out of Ketchmick Bay. That's um, in the interior out of like the hub of Fairbanks, I believe. And we will be continuing this in G to G. This brings girls from all over the state of Alaska. Those are prioritized. And it, it's an incredible experience. It's completely free. And it's offered to people who maybe have not had the exposure to these opportunities before. Um, those are prioritized. So, next. Another um, program that I worked on myself is called the Faces of STEM. And this is a really neat opportunity to interview scientists. They are all UA alumni from across all of the different campuses who have started in STEM um, degree seeking programs and are currently doing some awesome career paths um, throughout the state and even actually internationally. Um, and you can scan that QR code to read their stories. Um, this is just an opportunity to just demonstrate all of the unique paths um, that students, current students, STEM students could take um, and be inspired of, you know, there's no one right way to find a really cool STEM career. And um, other workshops that we work, other workshops that we work on include this uh, Alaska Native Governance and Protocols with the First Alaskans Institute. This was hugely popular. I can't take any credit for it. Uh, First Alaskans Institute did an amazing job creating um, a work, an opportunity for people to come together and learn how to um, interact and work better, more closely um, with the Alaska Native communities. They might be interested in conducting research in. 
And it was so popular that I'm pretty sure we will be doing many more. So just keep an eye out. <laughs> Next. This was super fun. Tara and I just did this, wrapped this up, feels like yesterday, um, in February. About almost 100 middle school students coming into Fairbanks and yeah, from in, around the state. From around the state. And they were in teams um, with their middle school units. And they did 16 hands on science events. It's a national tournament. So we had a winning team who are now going to go to Wichita and do the National Science Olympia tournament. And it was so much fun. The topics ranged from physics to chemistry to engineering. And, uh, it, was, it was a really good time. And so if you are, we would love to have a team from Dillingham if you're from here. Um, and we were able last year to, to provide travel support for those teams to get there. We also had them, they had the opportunity to stay overnight, um, which was pretty much required by any team traveling. So they got to stay in the dorms on campus and even had like an evening reception. So, I mean, I just, I actually have a friend who did this as a middle schooler and she's now an awesome engineer because she won the, I don't know, the bridge design competition. She's like, well, I guess I should do this. I'm really good at it. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> uh, next. Similar to what Tara mentioned earlier, um, DO has its own specific speed grant awards. And I just wanted to make sure that was mentioned so that um, anyone who's working in an education or outreach, you know, might seem a little less formal than the other um, speed grant awards, but they are able to, um, there's, there's a lot of different examples up here, but um, it's a lot of it is just, you know, as long as it's oriented to STEM or, um, you know, this is a really neat one, whale dissection. And I can definitely connect you with um, proposals that have been done before and connect you with someone who might be able to tell you more about how to apply for those. And, it, well, and just real quick, in addition, we also do data visualization seed grants. Okay. Um, so we've done those before. So we have a, that's coming up the data visualization team. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> but yeah, so we definitely look for different ways to kind of um, support, you know, not just basic research. And so the, the visualization ones were, were great as well. So keep yeah. an eye out for those. Yeah. We, we always put stuff out. Um, so please, please get on our mailing list if you're interested. I know, we should have put a mailing list link. Come find us at our table and we yeah. will sign yeah. you up. Because <laughs> yeah, I know we're throwing a lot at you right now, but it's just to show how many things are ongoing. And if you sign up for our mailing list, you'll hear about all of them yeah. <laughs> in real time. Uh, science pubs. Super fun. I don't know if you guys have ever attended them, but it's another opportunity to share our research with um, the community. This one was fun. We did it. It was a hybrid event um, with a wine expert. And so talked about, you know, where wines are made, where and glaciers. It worked. And um, <laughs> the natural history information for tour guides. Uh, thanks to Rick. He has presented with us twice. We had um, the tourism industry tell us what they're what people are asking about when they come to visit Alaska, and we got them, you know, a highlight reel of all of our science presenters um, get sharing like the most up to date science information about things like climate and aurora and salmon, and um, that went out to all of our a lot of our tourism vendors. So then when they're sharing information about how Alaska is changing and what's going on, um, it's accurate, and so all of our visitors can leave Alaska with a little bit more insight. Lastly, as Tara mentioned, um, we have, well, the seed grants are a little bit different, but on the thread of data visualization, we have an awesome team led by Naomi on the right there. And uh, she has two undergraduate interns, Joey and Bobby. They create things like uh, videos, animations, and um, including virtual reality options, which I'll talk about more in a second here. Um, but I am meant to share that they are open for business. So if you are interested in having something um, like a data visualization product for yourself, these are not EPSCOR exclusive um, workers. And so that if you have research that you would be interested in creating an interesting data visualization product, um, we could easily connect you with these guys. They make amazing videos that are very good at um, kind of deciphering complex issues and um, findings. So, next. In the other room at our table, we have this FireWise VR game, which was made in partnership with the Alaska Science Fire, Fire, Science. Fire Science Consortium. And, oh, it's right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for myself. Um, <laughs> Brittany. Um, anyways, it's an interactive tool to prepare your house for fire season. And it, yeah, come check it out at our table. It's really impressive what they've done. 
um, and really fun to engage with the public um, and to share. It's like a stepping stone into that conversation of a deeper topic. And sometimes the little kids will just go to town with it and then go home and tell their parents, like, that's too sad. You shouldn't have a gas can there. You should, you should have a trip. It's really fun. Clean your room. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Okay, so here's our contact information and yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and like we said, we're over there. So if there was anything we talked about that you're like, we want to know more, please come talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question, but I could come talk to you. Uh, yeah, you sure. Can. We can, we'll, we'll be over there. Hi. Do I just share screen and get it get it going? Yeah, share screen and get it going. All right, let's do it. Hang on one sec. All right. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Am I on the right display? It's not full screen yet. Hmm. How about that? Yeah. All right. All right. So I, I can't see who's in the room, but um, thank you very much for having me come to WASC and for doing this Zoom wise. I'd like to be there, but uh, I had my own travel woes kind of, and you guys have all had yours. <laughs> so, um, I am Gay Sheffield. I work for Alaska Sea Grant, so I am Tav's, Tav Amu's neighbor to the north, and um, I am a public servant of the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. So I'm going to give a talk on this emerging issue of uh, harmful algal bloom in the Bering and Chukchi Sea what was document, kind of the history of it, what was documented last year, which was rather extraordinary, and then where, how we responded to that and kind of what, what we're doing to gear up for 23. So just to start with, um, this just shows you the Bering Street region. And by that, I have it over into Chukotka because we share the same waterway. We're not allowed over there, of course, but the uh, border, which is that little thin blue line, goes through there. But all the yellow dots are communities in the Bering Street region. Lots of communities up and down the coast. All right, and this is just an auger, augered in look at Nome, where we're located, and all the yellow dots for the Bering Street, what's considered the Bering Street region and also for our neighbors. All right, now I'm gonna kind of read a little bit because I gotta keep this on task. So for this slide, before I begin, you know, it looks like I'm some kind of pro doing this all by myself. That is not the case at all. I am part of a big collab collaborative effort, both in the region and outside the region that's going on. And these are just a, a handful, there's many others. Uh, but you can see we're a huge, uh, it's a big research project. It's a big community uh, health issue, so forth and so on. And we'll get into it. So buckle in, here we go. All right, so we need marine algae. They are vital, right? We can't be here without, We actually none of us would be here without algae because uh, these. this is the base of the food chain and provides food to clams krill, tunicates. Up here, they're known as upa. Oh, wow, there's lots of people. Hi. Uh, crab and many, many fish. For us up here, it's like the capelin, the herring, sand lance, that kind of thing. And the best example of seeing good algae in the north, anyway, is when you auger through your sea ice to start setting your crab line through the ice. And you look underneath, and probably in Bristol Bay too, you look underneath the ice as you're pulling out your debris there once you've augered in. And you can see the brown material on the bottom side of the ice. That is all good algae. And, and, um, and then we get more during the summer. 
All right. So we're going to talk on this talk about Alexandrium catenella. And that is in Alaska. It's a, it's a type of algae. There's lots of types of algae. There, it turns out there's lots of types of harmful algae, but this is a good, this is one of the few types that is not what we want to see, Alexandrium catenella. It's usually found in large amounts in the water warmers of the Gulf of Alaska and further south, like southeast. Alexandrium produces a powerful nerve toxin called saxitoxin. It's one of the biotoxins that cause paralytic shellfish poisoning, lovingly known as PSP. Uh, this is a paralytic shellfish poisoning is well known throughout the rest of the country's coast, as well as in the Gulf of Alaska and Southeast. And, and now it's kind of, we all know about it now because we're all going to face it. Um, paralytic shellfish poisoning can occur in people, seabirds, marine mammals. And that happens when you eat clams or crabs or other seafood that has been contaminated with large amounts of saxitoxin that is found in the phytoplankton, the algae called alexandrium. Saxitoxin targets the nervous system and blocks nerve function. So you eat it, stomach, bloodstream, up to your head, and it starts blocking your nerve ending, uh, nerve signaling. It has no smell, no taste, and cannot be destroyed by cooking or by freezing. Okay, so this little plant is dependent on sunlight, just like any other plant, nutrients. And in this case, Alexandrium likes warm water to grow. And when conditions are right for uh, any of these algaes, including Alexandrium, um, it'll quickly divide and grow. Once it hits the spot, once any of these algaes find something that is just right for them, just right for them, they can uncontrollably start splitting and growing. When you see that, it takes over the water column. When you see that going on, that is a bloom event. Now you can have good algae do a bloom event, thumbs up. If you have harmful algae doing a bloom event, thumbs down. Okay, and that's known as a harmful algal bloom event. Okay, Alexandrium is not new to the Arctic. And it has been in low, uh, low levels. So it arrives, all water flows north through the Bering Strait for the most part. And Alexandrium can arrive and get whooshed right on through the Bering Strait region uh, from the warmer, nutrient-rich waters of the south. And you can see in this little picture, the Alexandrium cells in this little cartoon is, are the little orange dots, you know, and it says, oh, they're rushing through. And where the arrows get really small, tiny little arrows, that's where the current kind of starts settling out. It gets really fast in the Bering Strait. That northern current, the northbound current is squished through the Bering Strait and runs at speed through there and starts to, when it widens out, starts to slow down. Alexandrium can wait. So it, as the water gets colder, once you whizzle through the Bering Strait region, right, we're warming up tremendously. And if anyone's been talking about sea ice, you, you can very much see that that's happened. Or if you live along the coast of Western Alaska, you don't need to be told. So as the water gets colder, as it's come, that warm water's bringing the Alexandrium. Used to be as it gets colder, it would sort of settle out. As the current, as it goes through the Bering Strait, kind of just as a plant kind of carried along in the current, and the current slows up there in the Northeast Chukchi, Alexandrian will stop growing because it doesn't like the cold, and it falls to the seafloor, and then it starts, the cells will actually change, and it goes into a resting phase or a cyst or what, for my brain, I would call like a seed. It turns into like a little resting seed stage, and it sits there and can be viable for over 100 years and it can just accumulate. So on the left, you could sort of see that is sort of the Bering Street region. We can get a bloom now carried up to us and it goes zipping along. And once it slows out in the Northeast Chukchi, um, it drops to the bottom. How would you get that back up again? Or how would you get those cysts to turn on? Because we, we've been cold water, we still are cold water, like to think. 
And you need water that's about um, eight degrees C or about 46 degrees Fahrenheit to come and, and kind of wake it up. Or you need a big storm event that rolls the bottom and gets those cysts back up into the daylight. All right, not new. I said it was not new. Bering Street regional peoples have historical knowledge of red tides and which is kind of erroneous. They don't necessarily have to be red, but the red tide is, is a word, words equivalent to a harmful algal bloom commonly. Um, have events or clams that make you sick, both in regional place names as well as living knowledge. So this, uh, this map here with all the marine mammals shows that there was a NOAA study published in 2016 that looked at 13 uh, species of marine mammals. This is in the lower right and showed that saxitoxin was in every species that was tested. Not a lot of it in some most cases, but it's around. It's sort of like it's been around. And it's it's uh, our cold waters. It doesn't like cold water. So eh, we I probably have some in me and so do the other animals um, if I'm eating out of the sea, sea. All right, so the concern is less sea ice, warmer waters, are the warming ocean conditions allowing Alexandrium to grow often and in larger amounts? So there is a large research effort going on underway, um, funded by NOAA, and it's studying saxitoxin in the food web and in marine mammals and other seafoods. And it is also looking at seawater. So, you know, this topic of harmful algal blooms, people knew, you know, maybe it was something that was coming our way. So we people started to think, well, we should probably look at that. And then we had a big shocker last year. Hook. Yeah. And so in this one, you can see that walrus and there's a red circle around the diamede. That's where diamede is, little diamede. <clears throat> and we kind of knew things might be not right because in 2017, a walrus was harvested at diamede after being called in, right? Hunters will call in animals, but this one came right out of the water, put its head down. It was extremely tired, which is very unusual. Anyway, this walrus was harvested. And when the feces was tested, which would show you what it had eaten, and if it had any of this biotoxin in its system, by golly, it had five times over the seafood safety limit in 2017. And we have no idea whether that amount, there's no data on saxitoxin in walrus, and we have no idea whether that amount, which would have been uh, tremendously bad for people, um, if that had any caused that behavior in the water. And then there's been several research cruises, but in 2018, 2019, um, there were clams that were sampled all over from, the, from sort of where that walrus head is. Actually, the whole Bering Sea was sampled, but where they were really augured in to get clam and worm samples were right where that walrus head is, all the way up to Utkiagvik. In two locations, they found uh, about 70 miles. Well, right where that walrus is, is kind of St. Lawrence. He's underneath, he's overlaying uh, St. Lawrence Island. So about 70 miles north, northwest of Savunga, between Savunga and Diomede, there were clams that were found to be above the seafood safety regulatory limit and also about 70 miles north of Point Hope. So that's the star and the red circle at the top. Um, you know, that's a, those are sort of eye-opening to hear that, but they were sampling a lot of areas and they did not have the clams above the seafood safety limit, but those places they did have them. All right. So I said that the um, cis, the, Alexandrian, when it gets wuzzled up, once it here gets into that cold water of the Chukchi and starts to fall out and make those seeds, um, they were also sampling in those cruises to find out how many seeds were up there. Well, this map on the right will show you that uh, it doesn't have any data for where the border is because we can't go over and sample with the Russians and it's not that friendly right now of course to to do any kind of joint studies but they did the best they could and they found a whopping number of seeds of alexandrium the cyst stage so kind of waiting for warm water and then if that thing catches up and starts to go that'll be quite something so that finding that amount of seeds 
of Alexandrium already in the Chukchi Sea was very sobering and really important information. It is the largest seedbed, if you will, of Alexandrium in the United States waters anywhere, and by far the largest and the most uh, highest number of seeds per cubic centimeter. All right, so to date, we know from some of the preliminary research, we already have a problem potentially with walruses eating clams because their saxitoxin has been in the clams in a high level and occasionally, and they can get potentially affected if we go with what happened in 2017. And also people eating fright from the stomach, which is the picture on the right, just below the walrus. If they're eating clams from the stomach, which is common practice here, and they are delicious when you eat them that way, they've already been like ceviche, they've already been pre-cooked. Um, that's a problem because all that green in there is the algae that's been released from the stomachs of the clam in the walrus stomach. So it's sort of an algae soup in there. Um, and also you could potentially people directly by eating shellfish. We've got evidence of that, that we've already been five times over the seafood safety limit in some places at some times. All right, so then what does this mean? So I'm gonna bring it back to people. So the Gulf of Alaska, which is that orangey Gulf of Alaska haze I put over Southeast Alaska, kind of right on into the peninsula. Um, they've got warmer waters than we do, and certainly warmer waters than the Chukchi. And it's the best growing conditions, honestly, for better growing conditions for Alexandrium. And so they are definitely aware of this issue. And they live with blooms all the time. And, and that's something we're learning about and learning from. They have had the highest number of cases of paralytic shellfish poisoning. And in the last 28 years, just to sort of give you kind of an idea of what it means for us, 28 years, there's been 132 people. So about five people a year are reported sick from eating and reported through the healthcare system were reported sick from eating seafoods contaminated with high levels of saxitoxin. About 82% of the people needed medical attention and five people have died from paralytic shellfish poisoning. And then during 2020, unfortunately, um, the first fatality in the Bering Sea was documented. Okay, so hopefully you're all with me now still. All right. All right. So here we go. So what happened last year? So we have this research vessel that was uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and they were on a dedicated cruise, and they were going to go from Nome to Utqiagovic twice. They left Nome, and they were going to go to St. Lawrence Island there in the lower uh, left and go take a trail, and their trail is that uh, gray line, and take a trail all the way up to Utqiagovic turn around, bring her back down the same way to Nome and do it again. And so this was from July. This cruise was from like July to September. Everybody was excited. They thought they were going to find a whole bunch of bloom going on where that massive cis bed was, seed bed up in the Northeast Chukchi. All right. Um, so it wasn't the case. It was This whole thing was just hard for us to imagine and caught us all off guard. So uh, sort of like the future came earlier than anticipated. And we this is the first time they ever had a cruise dedicated just for harmful algal bloom. So I mean, honestly, it was well, well timed. Okay. So the ship leaves Nome with the researchers on board in July and gets up to Utqiagovic by August 8th. And you can kind of see their trail. The stars are our, our communities, coastal communities right along the trail. And right off the bat, they left Nome and went to the west side of St. Lawrence Island off Gamble. And that little bit of yellow, although the, it doesn't look like it lines up, trust me, it lines up. The little bit of yellow, they were like, oh my gosh, you have 16 to 20,000 cells per liter of Alexandrium. So in one liter of water, 16,000 cells. And they called and they said, this is really, we don't feel comfortable about this because on the East Coast of the United States or elsewhere, when you have a thousand cells in a liter of water, a thousand cells of Alexandrium in a liter of water, it's, a, it's like, it's bad. 
it's very much concerning and you can they'll start to close fisheries and you know recreational clamming and things like that if they get that uh, one to two thousand that's considered a, a high level so here we were in Nome, and luckily the researchers had contacted us beforehand and we were all communicating which is good and we were like, my God, okay, well, I guess we're, holy cow. So we started making phone calls and we'll talk about the response in a sec. At that time, we did get a sample from a spotted seal, but no saxitoxin, thank goodness, in the in the poo. Well, they they were coming back down from Utkiagovic from August 8th to August 14th. They could not go back to St. Lawrence Island due to weather. And so look what happened. Now we're at 40,000 cells per liter off of, in the not only off in the Bering Strait, but also now off of um, Shishmaref and south of Kivalina. So the bloom had grown and it was shifting, it was on the move. So interestingly, that blue up in the Northeast where everybody thought was gonna be trouble, perfectly nice, perfectly nice. All right. And we had no samples during that time. So the sh ship came in, bought eggs, got water, whatever they needed. And then they took off again and they were going to do the trail again. Again, they couldn't go to St. Lawrence Island because of the weather, if that tells you anything. But now it kept getting worse. We mm -hmm. were, if you had under the star of the uh, diamede right here, it's bright red, kind of like this. We were at over... 100,000 cells per liter. At this point, the ship was telling us, um, it doesn't matter. We won't know the toxicity of the water at this point, but this is this is incredible and it's danger. It's all we'll say. You're all, you know, you're in peril at this point. And so that was shocking. These are shocking numbers. And at that time, Interestingly enough, um, the ship got to, we didn't get to St. Lawrence Island, but we were able to do at this time, this is when it was most sort of highest and dangerous. We were able to get the red dot on St. Lawrence Island is from Savunga. A clam was caught on a long line hook, amazingly, kind of a gift from God, this one. And there was actually a discussion by the keepers of it. It was a big six inch surf clam. People wanted to eat it, wanted to feed it as a specialty food because it was so healthy, such a big, beautiful clam. They wanted to share it with the youngest of the family to sort of introduce them into the, um, you know, the, the best of the foods. And so there was discussion saying, you know, uh, myself and the Norton Sound Health Corporation were asking for for samples. We were we were saying it is it is crazy, and we're trying last, you know, send us what you got. We'll get it tested. We don't really understand. Uh, what what is happening with our seafloor or our seafoods? That clam, that red dot. Thank goodness they sent it in and did not consume it. It was five times over the seafood safety limit. And you know when you, this is novel to this area, totally novel to us all. And the fact that they were, you know, it was going to go to a two year old. Um, I'm just saying it was that was very sobering. You know, people. Uh, new to us this is new to us and it has big consequences potentially hey just a heads up we're 10 minutes over our time um just just as a heads up 10 <laughs> minutes over yeah all right we'll get right to it bloom uh, you should oh, I, so sorry you guys <laughs> so I, anyway we'll pass right up know that um for the bloom event itself it was all about that. It was all about communications. The research vessel was communicating to Sea Grant and Norton Sound Health Corporation, as well as AOS, the Alaska Ocean Observing. Sea Grant and uh, Norton Sound Health Corporation, we pulled the Department of Public Health in, and they were actually brought in well, immediately. And so th that's why they're circled in green. Having the Department of Public Health probably saved lives. They were able to stand our clinics up in 24 hours. And when it, the poison was found or the high cell numbers were found off of Manilux territory. They're a health corporation for Northwest Arctic Borough. They could rope it right in and they had the benefit of Norton Sound Health Corporation. 
we went regional hard on regional media, right? We don't care about ADN or, or Fairbanks, right? We need to talk to the people of this region immediately. And basically, saxitoxin is in the food web. We had the largest saxitoxin bloom and strongest in the country ever. And luckily, thank God, nobody was uh, reported sick through the healthcare system. And we don't know what's happened to those cysts, especially after Murbach. And we need a lot of help. We need more seawater sampling, more food, more marine mammals, because we comprehensively utilize the marine ecosystem here. Sepunculid worms are eaten, crab, tunicates, marine mammals, seabirds, the whole nine yards. So 2023 brings us, and this is the last slide, 2023 in the Bering Strait region, you do the best with what you have and you can always ask for help. Those are really rural Alaska's uh, motto, I think. And for us, the Norton Sound Health Corp Corporation's Office of Environmental Health, I can't sing their praises enough. They are doing regional community seawater sampling program, and they have a long-term goal for that. A never-ending goal is to continue now to see, uh, sample the seawater and get us kind of like a, a warning system going. But it is limited in its coverage. We need our seafoods tested, tested, tested this summer, and we're trying to figure out how to get that done. And the EcoHab project that I'm involved with is getting samples. We're getting samples from the research community as they are working their way up here all the way to Barrow as far as clams offshore. Locally here in Nome, we're collecting uh, intestinal samples from marine mammals. We're collecting seabirds, getting them to the right uh, people. And also we will be helping um, Norton Sound Health Corporation with testing the seafoods. So right now, all we can do, and we're really busy with it, is reaching out to the state of Alaska Department of Public Health, coordinating everybody and getting our regional media ready again. Only this time, we are going to blindly broadcast our updates. They're going to be translated into Russian because into yeah into Russian because here in the Bering Strait region, our radio stations are listened to over in Chukotka. So uh, because we do top of the weather, really nice, you know, the National Weather Service. And I think they kind of want to hear Rick Toman too. But um, the, <laughs> the uh, National Weather Service gets the top of the hour on the hour for the weather. So um, the Russians do listen in Chukotka. And so that way we can, if we, if the federal government can't figure out a way to communicate, we do have a moral obligation to make sure our neighbors are not in peril. Um, when it comes to this sort of thing, environment. With that, sorry to go over. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Gary.